The Enlightenment, with its focus on ideas encouraging reform, inevitably led to challenges of the political status quo in Europe. Well, given the focus on rights, it also, and perhaps also inevitably, led to challenges of the social status quo in Europe. And, since European powers had control over most of the Western Hemisphere, it was perhaps, again, inevitable, that these calls for reform would happen in the Americas as well. All that said, as we discovered with the French Revolution, calls for reform weren't all based on the ideals of the Enlightenment, not at a time when a majority of the population was illiterate and simply hadn't had the opportunity to participate in such educated debate. Sometimes, the calls for reform came because of the struggle to survive. As we've seen historically, any time a majority of the population is struggling, and especially when they're struggling because of social and political institutions which help cause that struggle, then some sort of revolt is likely. As we'll see, the Mexican Revolution was a mix of things. A call for political reform, yes, but also a call to change institutions which had oppressed the people of New Spain for much too long. So now, the Mexican Revolution. Actually, slight edit, the first Mexican Revolution. In one sense, the story of Mexico's fight for independence begins across the Atlantic with the rise of a French, actually a Corsican, Corsica's a small island in the Mediterranean, politician named Napoleon Bonaparte. Of the Directory, that moderate government which took control in mid-1794 after the execution of Robespierre, tried to stamp out any pro-Robespierre feeling left in France. A Napoleon Bonaparte had been part of the military loyal to Robespierre. The directors, therefore, refused to give Napoleon a high-level military post. They didn't trust him. And so Napoleon was forced to pander to the desires of the directorate in order to prove himself worthy of their trust. Unfortunately, he was able to do just that when he was sent to Italy to lead the French army occupying that peninsula. The French were in Italy to fight the Austrian army, which was still at war with France, in revenge for the executions of the monarchs, remember, the leader of Austria, Leopold, is Marie Antoinette's brother. Within a year, Napoleon had defeated the Austrian army and claimed northern Italy for the growing French empire. Oh, now a French military hero, Napoleon eventually took part in the 1799 conspiracy with the Abbe Sayez and Napoleon's older brother Lucien to overthrow the directorate. Oh, the plan was to establish a triumvirate-style government, called the consulate, in which the three main conspirators would take turns as consuls, as executives in charge of the government. Napoleon, though, was quick to take advantage of the fact that he became the first consul. Within four years, Napoleon would be crowned emperor of the French Empire. Both during the Directory and then as consul and emperor, Napoleon faced a variety of wars between about 1796 and 1815. A collectively known as the Napoleonic Wars, they occurred as a result of European powers' concern over French expansion and fears that the revolutionary ideals of late 18th century France would spread to other European countries. When Napoleon fought wars against various coalitions, including, at various times, the United Kingdom, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and any of their allies. Now, he was often successful against his enemies, especially in land wars involving these enemies. In 1806, Napoleon was able to dismantle the Holy Roman Empire. Oh, as you can see on the map, Austria remained in place, but all of the other German states became the Confederation of the Rhine. Now, in doing so, he'd gotten rid of a major enemy, and he didn't have to worry about them anymore. That was fantastic. But he did have one enemy that he could never quite defeat, and that was Great Britain. So in 1808, he decided that he was going to get at Great Britain by attacking the only ally they had left on the continent, and that was Portugal. Now, of course, to get to Portugal, he pretty much had to go through Spain. Now, Napoleon was able to get the Spanish king's reluctant approval to have the great army march through Spain, but then the Spanish populace revolted in rebellion. They did not want the French in their country. Uh, thus, the Peninsular War, the fight for control of the Iberian Peninsula, began in the spring of 1808. Uh, Charles IV, the King of Spain, was forced to abdicate in favor of his son, Ferdinand VII, who soon entered into an unexpected alliance with Great Britain in an effort to rid Spain of the French. 
Well, for much of 1808, the fighting went back and forth in Spain, essentially to a draw. However, in December of 1808, Napoleon captured Madrid and with it claimed control of all of Spain, although the war would continue. Nonetheless, Napoleon placed his brother Joseph on the throne as the king of Spain, forcing King Ferdinand to fight from exile and pushing many Spaniards to flee Spain for safety across the Atlantic in the Americas. Oh, at the outbreak of the Peninsular War, the Spanish royal family sent representatives out to the colonies, seeking oaths of loyalty from the colonists. These representatives, members of the Spanish nobility, prepared for a lengthy stay in the Americas, and they were hoping to create and train armies which could then be sent to support the Spanish government against France. However, in the vice royalties of New Spain, as Mexico was known, and of South America, the colonists resented the influx of these Spaniards, remember, they're known as peninsulares, because these newcomers wanted to become the new authority in the colonies. Now, this agenda did not agree with that of the Creoles, who, because of the now centuries-old casta system, had traditionally been the politically powerful class in the colonies. But tensions between these two privileged and powerful groups escalated. Some of the Creole leaders of Querétaro, the textile production center of New Spain, began organizing a raid against the peninsulares in Mexico. Now, these Creoles were concerned that the peninsulares had no intention of supporting their king. In fact, the peninsulares had overthrown the viceroy of New Spain and taken charge themselves. The conspiracy formed to rid New Spain of these traitors. Now, the main conspirators included Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez, who was the wife of the magistrate of Querétaro, Ignacio Pérez, who was the mayor of Querétaro, and a most unlikely addition, a priest by the name of Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla. Hidalgo was not a priest in the 19th century sense of the word, or even in our modern sense of the word. As a child, he'd begun learning the indigenous languages of the native peoples in his home area of Michoacán. He'd been sent to university where he continued to learn languages, including French and Italian. And learning French, he'd been able to access the texts of the Enlightenment. Hidalgo was ordained a priest in 1778, and given his intelligence, he was nicknamed El Zorro, the Fox, because of his cleverness. He should have been on course for a high-flying career within the church. However, his constant meddling with both church and royal authorities, as well as his refusal to abide by vows of chastity, Hidalgo maintained relationships with two women and eventually sired five children, that kept him in trouble. Eventually, the church sent him to be the parish priest for a tiny village called Dolores, about 53 miles northwest of Querétaro, thinking that he couldn't possibly cause trouble there. While the conspirators had planned their revolt for December 8th, a holiday on the Catholic calendar, but the colonial authorities heard of the plan in early September. When the authorities arrived to question Doña Josefa, some of the other conspirators were hiding in her basement. When Doña Josefa was told she was under house arrest, she stomped her foot three times on the floor, a prearranged warning to those hiding in the basement to let them know that the authorities had discovered the conspiracy. Ignacio Perez struck out of the basement and he traveled to Dolores to let Father Hidalgo know what had happened. Determined to continue the plan, Hidalgo set the revolt in motion months in advance. On the morning of September 16th, Hidalgo rang his church bells and woke his parishioners, who dressed and assembled in front of the church. Hidalgo then proceeded to urge his listeners to follow him in the movement to preserve New Spain from the peninsulares. It's doubtful that he went so far as to insist on independence from Spain on this occasion, but his Grito de Dolores, as the speech is called, nonetheless marks the beginning of the independence movement in Mexico. While the conspiracy had been planned by Creoles, who were upset that their authority had been usurped, it was the mestizos, the mulatos, and the indios who actually began the revolt. Hidalgo's band of soldiers was made up of disenfranchised members of society, people who believed in the message, they absolutely knew what it was to be oppressed, but had no clue how to fight for it. The rebels were defeated by a peninsular army in January of 1811. After this defeat, Hidalgo was sent before the inquisitorial court. Clergy members always went before church courts. They were never tried in secular courts. And he was found guilty of heresy. The colonial government, again run by peninsulares, determined that Hidalgo should be executed as an example to other would-be rebels. They used his determination of a heretic to execute him, and he was executed by firing squad that summer. 
His severed head was taken to Guanajuato and kept on display outside the palace for the next 10 years. As it turns out, another priest, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón, was ready to take up Hidalgo's mantle. Unlike Hidalgo, Morelos was a good military strategist and was able to plan his attack in advance. A priest in the same vein as Hidalgo, he also maintained relationship with a woman and fathered three children. In fact, Hidalgo and Morelos are distantly related. They were both descendants of Hernán Cortés. Um, Morelos felt really strongly about the goals of the Hidalgo revolt. But he took Hidalgo's movement, which essentially constituted a peasant's revolt, and he formed it into a movement with a set political platform to gain independence from Spain. In September of 1813, three years after the start of the rebellion, Morelos called a Congress together at Chilpancingo, and this Congress officially declared independence from Spain. Morelos was formally recognized as the leader of the Mexican revolutionary movement. Unfortunately, a lack of resources crippled Morelos's ability to lead a consistently strong army. Well, by this time, the Spanish and British had turned the tide against the French in Spain, and the Peninsulares had appealed to the Spanish for help in ending the rebellion in Mexico. And now that the Peninsulares were working with the Spanish government, Morelos couldn't really hope to defeat them. In 1815, Morelos was captured by colonial authorities. Like Hidalgo, he was taken before the inquisitorial court, found guilty of heresy, and executed by the colonial authorities in December. While pockets of Mexican rebel activity remained spread throughout the countryside, the Spanish had, for the most part, secured all of New Spain. It seemed that the revolt had been squashed. Now, part of the reason the colonial authorities were somewhat certain that the rebellion was over was because the Spanish had adopted a constitution in 1812. An incredibly liberal document for its time, this constitution limited the power of the monarchy and established separation of powers. It also outlined certain freedoms, like freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and universal male suffrage. However, in the colonies, the authorities had stalled in implementing this new constitution. In fact, they stalled so long that, after Napoleon had been defeated in the continent in 1814, Ferdinand VII returned to full authority in Spain and revoked that constitution, reinstituting an absolutist monarchy. The people of the Americas had never had the opportunity to live under the Constitution of 1812. As such, they were incredibly upset that it had been revoked. Mexicans were not amused. They were not willing to give up. In the meantime, Napoleon's defeat in Spain had followed his unsuccessful invasion of Russia in 1812. By early 1814, France's enemies had marched into France and forced Napoleon to abdicate his throne. These allies then returned the Bourbon family to the throne of France. Because Louis XVI's surviving son had died of illness during the French Revolution, it was Louis XVI's brother, who also took the regnal name of Louis, who became king in 1814. And Napoleon was initially exiled to the island of Elba, which is off the coast of Italy. However, he escaped that island in March of 1815 and attempted to retake control of the French Empire in Europe. For the next 100 days, Napoleon gathered an army again, forcing Louis XVIII to flee to Vienna and forcing the Allies to once again muster armies against Napoleon. Well, in June of 1815, Napoleon met his enemies in modern-day Belgium at the Battle of Waterloo, where he was finally defeated. This time, despite some calls to execute him, Napoleon was exiled again to an island, this time the island of St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean, 1,000 miles away from the nearest continent. Now, after Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, the Allies returned to Vienna, where they'd already begun a peace conference to end the wars with France. In the end, the Congress of Vienna essentially attempted to return Europe to a traditional and conservative status quo, to return Europe to what it had been prior to the French Revolution, and in fact, even prior to the Enlightenment. France again became a monarchy, and while they didn't recreate the Holy Roman Empire, they did allow Austria and the other major German state, Prussia, significant influence over the confederation of German states in Central Europe. The Netherlands was recognized as a kingdom of its own and was able to annex what is now Belgium, and in return, the Dutch had to give up their largest colony, Cape Colony, in Southern Africa, to the British. The great powers of Europe, Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, Russia, and yes, even France, then promised to work 
together in a diplomatic way to avoid more European-wide wars. This new agreement, called the Concert of Europe, was meant to maintain a balance of power in Europe. The idea was that if everyone worked on maintaining that status quo, then there shouldn't be all-out war again on the continent. The end of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe did not, however, bring peace to Mexico. Where the Creoles might have been appeased with the adoption of the Constitution of 1812, they were angered by Ferdinand's decision to revoke it, and revolutionary fervor, never quite snuffed out, returned to Mexico. This time, the leader of the Mexican rebels was Vicente Guerrero, a soldier of mixed mestizo and African heritage. Well, the Spanish ordered Creole Agustín de Iturbide to deal with the new rebellion in 1820. However, Iturbide and Guerrero instead negotiated an alliance. It seemed that the leader of the Royalist army now felt the Creoles had more in common with other Mexicans than with the Spaniards. The two met and eventually agreed to the Plan of Iguala, a basic outline for a new country of Mexico. The plan included three major provisions. One, that the religion of Mexico would officially be Roman Catholicism. Two, that Mexico would gain independence and autonomy. Mexico would separate from Spain and form its own constitutional monarchy, but would consider still being a part of the Spanish Empire. And three, unity. Full social and legal equality for all citizens regardless of ethnicity. This last provision would end the Gasta system. Well, given Iturbide's popularity in Mexico at that time, as well as the fervor of the revolts of the 1810s, the Spanish monarchy soon realized that Mexican independence was inevitable. The Spanish and Mexicans signed the Treaty of Córdoba in August of 1821, which formally recognized Mexican independence. However, this treaty allowed the Spanish to appoint Mexico's new monarch and, if they didn't do so within a given time frame, allowed the new Mexican parliament to select their own monarch. Well, the new Mexican government was made up of people primarily loyal to Iturbide, so he was selected by them as the first emperor of Mexico in 1822. Now keep in mind that Mexico at that time included modern-day Texas, California, and the entire U.S. Southwest, as well as most of Central America. However, there was a group of Mexicans, both Creoles and Mestizos, who sought to revise the Constitution and create a Republican government. They published a plan for creating a Republic in December of 1822, and the plan drew widespread support, particularly from those who opposed Iturbide. Moreover, Iturbide faced opposition from the people of Central America, who didn't like being a part of the Mexican Empire. They'd hoped to be granted independence separately from Mexico. In February of 1823, these new Republican rebels, led by a group that included Antonio López de Santa Ana, published a new, more refined plan for establishing a Republican government in Mexico. This was called the Plan of Casamata. By the end of February, the rebels had won most of the popular support in Mexico. Agustín I formally abdicated in March, the first and only monarch of Mexico, and Mexico officially became the Republic of Mexico. In July, Central America would declare itself independent from Mexico and Spain and form a country known as the Federal Republic of Central America, which would remain in place until 1841. Mexico would rename itself Los Estados Unidos de México, the United States of Mexico, and use the abbreviation EU for their country. As a side note, since the formal name of our country is the United States of America, there's obviously room for confusion. So, in Mexico and in much of Latin America, the abbreviation for the United States is EEUU to distinguish it from the abbreviation for Mexico, which remains EU. And yes, since the creation of the European Union in the mid-90s, there's even more confusion. Oh well. So, we see that the Mexican Revolution is similar to the French Revolution in that there was more than just Enlightenment ideas at play. Yes, Enlightenment ideas undoubtedly influenced the conspirators in Querétaro. We know for certain that they influenced Father Hidalgo. But most Mexicans rebelled because they were struggling to survive, and they felt that a political and social change was needed to facilitate reform. As is often true with revolutions, there isn't just one cause or influence and, as is also true, the aftermath of revolution 
doesn't always solve the problems that led to revolt in the first place. After all, why else would this revolution in Mexico ultimately be referred to as the first Mexican revolution?